Take your Bible this morning for our scripture reading, if you would please. Isaiah chapter 9. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 9. Say, so I think I was here. You might say I was here last Sunday. We read the same scriptures while we're reading through, we're preaching through the names here. Mention Isaiah 9 and verse 6. We've talked about his name will be called Wonderful. We talked about his name will be called Counselor. Today we talk about his name being called the Mighty God. <clears throat> so we're working through the Everlasting Father and the Prince of Peace for the five Sundays here of December. And uh, so we'll read these verses again together, verses 6 and 7 of Isaiah chapter 9. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. And let's read both these verses in unison, beginning on verse number 6. Ready? For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it, and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And let's pray. Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture this morning. Lord, I want to thank you for the wonderful music today. Uh, yeah, I've enjoyed it and it's ministered to my heart. I pray it's ministered to others in the room as well. Thank you for the people of God who love to sing the songs of God. And Lord, the, the message that has been in these songs today is, I pray it's been a blessing to you as we've sung with melody in our heart unto you this morning. And I pray now, Lord, that you will make our hearts ready to receive the truth from your word, that your blessing will be upon the special, as once again you, you help us to focus on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Bethlehem Calvary, Olivet Tell. Oh, what a Savior is mine. Mountain and plain with his praises shall swell. Oh, what a Savior is mine. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior is mine. Unto the uttermost, He's wonderful and glorious. Oh, what a Savior is mine. There on the cross where he died for my sin. Oh, what a Savior is mine. Giving his life a poor wonder to win. Oh, what a Savior is mine, rising again in His infinite grace. Oh, what a Savior is mine, shedding upon me the light of His face. Oh, what a Savior is mine. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior is mine. Unto the uttermost wonderful, glorious. Oh, what a Savior is mine, lifting my burdens, relieving my care. Oh, what a Savior is mine, giving me courage to do and to dare. 
Oh, what a Savior is mine. Sing with me if you would. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior is mine. Unto the uttermost wonderful glorious oh what a savior is mine amen oh that's good father we thank you for a wonderful savior we have in the lord jesus christ and lord i'm asking you that you would minister to our hearts this morning I'm asking you, Lord, to come and walk up and down the aisle and in and out of the rows and stop at every occupied seat, minister to the people in this room this morning. We're asking you to once again honor the preaching of your word. I pray you would help me as I bring the message this morning and help each individual as they listen. And We would understand and grasp that this child that is born and son that was given was the mighty God. Help us today. Minister to our hearts. Help us to see your greatness this morning. It's in Christ's name I ask it. Amen. We, we have talked about His name is be called Wonderful. We have talked about His name last week will be called Counselor. And now the third name that the Lord says that this child would be called would be the Mighty God. Jesus would be known as the Mighty God. I would ask you this morning, and we could ask many people today, just who is the Jesus that you say you're interested in? Who is this Jesus that you have placed your faith in? Is He a God who is all talk and no action? Is He distant? Is He just a far off man that you read about in the pages of the New Testament? Is He one that maybe you were once devoted to and on fire for, but now have lost confidence in Him? Is He in the compartment of your life marked religion that you visit and open up on Sunday, but he gets tucked away safely in a drawer for the rest of the week? I think that in our day and age, many have traded in the real Jesus. I think they've traded in the Jesus of the Bible for a a, a warm, cuddly teddy bear, Jesus. I think we've taken God out of His seat and replaced Him with a beaten down, politically correct, inferior, all affirming God of love. God said that that baby in the manger would be the mighty God. The Jesus that we follow, the Jesus of the Bible, the Jesus we sang about this morning, the Jesus who lives in our lives is the mighty God. The mighty God. I don't know if anybody here today needs a mighty God in your corner, but I sure do. And I'm glad that I have a mighty God. You face a mess of uh, that, that sometimes we make our own messes pretty good in life, get into situations that we wish we wouldn't have gotten ourselves into, but we need a mighty God to help us out of those situations. I like what the psalmist said when he said, this poor man cried and the Lord delivered him out of all his troubles. All his troubles. That means he even delivered me out of troubles that were of my own making. See, God never looks... Aren't you glad God doesn't look at you and say, you got yourself into that mess, you get yourself out? Huh? 
God, God, is, uh, God doesn't respond that way. He's a mighty God. He's a miracle-working God. He's a circumstance-changing God. He's a Satan-defeating God. He's a mighty God. And I'm glad that He is the mighty God. There's three thoughts I want to give you this morning in regards to, to Him being called the mighty God. Number one is, because He's the mighty God, we need to reverence Him as deity. Reverence Him as deity. We worship Christ as the Lord. We adore Jesus Christ as God. You're in Isaiah 9. Turn one chapter over to Isaiah 10, would you please? Isaiah 10. If you look with me at verse number 20. Isaiah 10 and verse 20. The Bible says, It shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as are escaped of the house of Jacob shall no more again stay upon him that smote them, but shall stay upon the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. In other words, God says that the day comes when God will destroy the enemies of Israel and the, the, the survivors of the house of Jacob. They're, they're, no, they're no longer going to rely on the ones who God has struck down. He said they're going to rely on the Lord. They're going to rely on the Holy One of Israel. And the Lord, by the way, is in all capital letters. When you see that in your English Bible, it means that it's the personal name of God Himself. It's Yahweh. And there's coming a day when they're going to rely on the Lord Himself. That's a promise for Israel. But wait a minute. Just who exactly is that? Notice verse 21. The remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob. And who are they going to return unto, church? The, the mighty God. Well, that sounds a lot like what we read in Isaiah 9, 6, doesn't it? He's the mighty God. The same name we have for Jesus Christ in Isaiah 9 and verse 6. Deuteronomy 10 and verse 17 says this, For the Lord your God is a God of gods and Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty God and a terrible, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. So Isaiah called Him the mighty Christ, and, and, and uh, Deuteronomy called Him the mighty God. Isaiah called Him the mighty God. Look over with me at Jeremiah. You're in Isaiah. Just turn to your right and go to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 32. Jeremiah, chapter 32. It's good to use your Bible when you go to church. Last I checked our sign out front, it still said Bible Baptist Church. Amen. Jeremiah 32. And notice with me verse number 18. Thou showest loving kindness unto thousands, and recompensed the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them, the great, the mighty God, the Lord of hosts, is His name. The great, the mighty God, the Lord of hosts, is His name. Jesus Christ, the child, the baby that was born in the manger, in Bethlehem, is none other than the mighty God Himself. God with us. Our life only gets purpose and meaning when we worship Him as the Lord God. When we understand who He is and we worship Him that way. Somebody said the problem is too many of us worship our work, then we work at our play and we play at our worship. No wonder our lives are so messed up. Now if you want purpose and meaning brought back into your life, then you have to worship Jesus Christ as Lord and Him alone. Listen, one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You either bow now voluntarily or you will bow later. And you'll acknowledge that He is the Lord. man was inspecting a house. He wanted to buy. He was particularly struck by the beauty of one of the rooms in the house that he wanted to use for a study. But he said to the man selling him the home, he said, but I don't like that cupboard in the corner. 
I'll have to remove it. The builder looked at him who was selling him the home and said, uh, I don't think you will. And the fellow said, well, I can do what I want if I buy the house. He said, not with that cupboard, you can't. And the fellow said, well, why not? Is it protected by a clause in the deed or something? And the builder said, no. It's not on the deed, but it is in the plans. You cannot take the cupboard, you can't take that cupboard away without taking down the house. It's part of the main structure. That's how it is with the worship of God and the worship of Jesus Christ as the mighty God. You can't live without that in your life without your whole structure falling apart. What has happened in our society? What is it that's going on that we see people doing things that were unimaginable? Living, not, by the way, whoever thought we'd live to see a day when people didn't know if they were even male or female? I mean, that, that's just, you, you, if, you'd have, if you'd have said that to somebody in the 1960s or even 1970s, they'd look at you like you had too many holes in your head. They'd have said, you need help. That was just unfathomable. What has happened to us in our society? What has happened to us is we've left God. And we've left the worship of God. And, 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 and everything is falling apart. Tim Keller in his book, The Reason for God, said this, If you center your life and your identity on your spouse or your partner, you'll be emotionally dependent, jealous, and controlling the other person's problems will be overwhelming to you. That's why I always cringe when I hear a husband or a wife in reference to one, either one say, well, she's my rock or he's my rock. My friend, there's only one rock and that's Jesus Christ. And the one... That you, listen, husbands, you ought to love your wife the second most person you love in the world and the first one ought to be God. And right after God, you love your wife. And, and wives, love your husband. Be better love God first. And then love your husband. He went on to say, if you center your life and identity around your family and children, then you try to live your life through your children until they resent you and have no self of their own. And at worst, you may abuse them when they displease you. If you center your life and your identity on your work and your career, you become a driven workaholic. At worst, you'll lose your family and your friends, and if your career goes poorly, you'll go into depression. If you center your life on identity, on money and possessions, you'll be eaten up by worry and jealousy about money. You'll be willing to do unethical things to maintain your lifestyle, which will eventually blow up in your face. If you center your life and your identity on relationships and approval, you're going to be constantly overly hurt by criticism and thus always losing friends. You'll fear confronting others and end up being a useless friend. If you center your life and your identity on a noble cause, you'll divide the world into good and bad and demonize your opponents. Ironically, you will be controlled by your enemies because without them you have no purpose. If you center your life on identity and identity, on religion and morality, if you're living up to your moral standards, then you'll get proud, self-righteous, and cruel. And if you don't live up to your moral standards, then you're devastated. You see, you're not wired, we aren't wired to build our life around anything other than Jesus Christ. He's the only one that we're to structure our lives around. He's the only one that will bring true meaning and purpose into your life. An old song used to say, the world will try to satisfy that deep longing in your soul. You'll search the whole world o'er, but you'll be just as before. You'll never find true satisfaction until you found the Lord. For only Jesus can satisfy your soul. There's a hole inside of your soul that only Jesus Christ is going to fill. 
And you can work and you can accumulate things and you can try to have relationships. You can do all the things you want to try to do, but that emptiness will still be there. That's why when Tom Brady won his first Super Bowl, he, he, he said, is that all there is? This is it? Hmm? Now I think he's got five of them, but he's still not fulfilled. Because that's not going to fill the hole. When Deion Sanders gave his testimony, he said he laid in bed after winning the Super Bowl MVP in the brand new Corvette out in his driveway, and it was like three or four in the morning before he finally went to bed, and he laid there thinking, is this all there is? Man, you're on top of the world. You just won the Super Bowl. You're the MVP of the Super Bowl. You ought to have, you've reached a pinnacle that you can reach in your profession. But it didn't fill the hole in his soul. Talked to those men on Friday at the prison and several of them testified how nothing fulfilled their soul. Nothing filled that hole until they met Jesus Christ. And it's changing their life. Don't center your life on anything else. You can try, and God gives you the free will, and people do it all the time. But I'll tell you what He brings. Heartache. Discouragement. Bondage. Pain. Jesus Christ is the mighty God. And He is to be worshipped. He is to be loved. The first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. So reverence Him as deity. He was God. He is God. Let me give you a second thought. Not only reverence Him as deity, but rely on Him as your defender. Rely on Him as your defender. In other words, trust Jesus Christ to protect you. I depend on the Lord Jesus to keep me secure. He's the mighty God. The word mighty is interesting because it's used often in the Old Testament especially about those who were heroes or champions in battle. You remember David had his 300 or 600 mighty men. And they were his protectors. They were his defenders. And they had some pretty amazing stories of what they, what they did in battle and uh, who fought for King David. Uh, one of them lifted his spear and against the enemy and killed about 300 of them by himself. Uh, these guys were uh, cut out of a different cloth than most of us were, okay? Uh, this guy, I think one of them said he jumped into the pit on a snowy day and killed a, a, a lion and a bear or whatever down in the pit. Uh, if, if a lion and a bear are down in the pit, that's where I'm not going, okay? <laughs> Just saying. But these guys jumped in after him. They were mighty men. Uh, remember, three of those mighty men broke into the Philistine camp and got a, a cup of water from the well that David wanted and brought it back to him, risked their lives to get David a cup of water. They were mighty men. They were heroes. They were champions of war. In other words, when, when it says Jesus is the mighty God, the, the mighty one, it means He's the champion. He's a great soldier. He's a valiant warrior. In fact, Jesus Christ makes all the, other, all the other warriors look like toy soldiers. He is the champion. Look at Isaiah 42 and verse 13, would you please? Isaiah 42 and verse 13. Notice what it says here again about the Lord. Verse 13, the Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. He shall cry, yea, roar. He shall prevail against his enemies. Who's that mighty man? I would tell you the mighty man is Jesus Christ. He's the one who prevails against his enemies. He doesn't just prevail against his enemies. He prevails against all of his enemies. Jesus Christ is undefeated. He's never lost a battle. He's, he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. Never one time was He defeated. And He's our defender. Uh, he protects us from our enemy. Hebrews 2.14 says this, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, 
He also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. When Jesus died on the cross, remember the Bible said that he'll bruise your heel, but Jesus, you'll crush his head. I don't know about you, if you have a choice between having a bruised heel or a crushed head, I think you take the bruised heel every time, okay? And uh, you may limp a little, but uh, you know what? A crushed head, you're done. And he crushed the head of Satan when he died on the cross and he got the victory. So Satan does not have to have power in your life anymore. You have a defender. You have someone who's canceled the power of sin in your life. That's Jesus Christ. Don't let Satan destroy your family. Don't let Satan destroy your relationships. Don't let Satan destroy your life anymore. He doesn't have the power over you. That's why God can tell us in the New Testament, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. You have to have to call on him. Call on him. He's right there. When the devil comes knocking, just send Jesus to answer the door. You stop answering the door. Rod Cooper was raised on a pig farm, which processed about a thousand pigs a year. In one field, they have two or three hundred little piglets running around. Every day at four in the morning, he had to feed those little oinkers. He walked into the field and they all scattered. And one day a little pig came up to him and began to chew on his foot. He picked the little pig up and began to pet him, but soon the little pig wanted down. But Rod said, no, I'll let you down when I'm ready. And at that moment, he said, that little pig let out a squeal such as he'd never heard in his life. And in about two seconds, 30 mama pigs weighing five to six hundred pounds, were headed his way. Rod said, I put the piglet down and headed for the fence. I barely made it over, and all the mama pigs were snorting, walking back and forth on the other side of the fence, saying, I dare you to come back over here and bother one of our kids. Now he reflected on that incident, and he said this, as I look back at that, I realized that little rascal was not intimidated. He was out of control, but he wasn't intimidated. Why not? Because he knew one squeal, he was only one squeal away from resources. You get it? Hmm? We're just one squeal away from resources. Just call out to him. One squeal is all it takes. And Jesus Christ, our defender, our champion, our mighty one, is there to defend us and to take care of the enemy. Reverence Jesus as deity, but recognize Him and, and rely upon Him as your defender. You know, the mighty God, He has no limitations. In Mark 5, some of you are familiar with the story of a father named Jairus. He had an only daughter who was 12, and she was dying. And he came to Jesus and sought Jesus to come to heal his daughter. Now Jairus was a ruler of the synagogue, so by coming to Jesus, he's going to lose his job. The, 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 the Jewish leaders were not embracing Jesus, okay? So, but he wants to save his daughter's life. And of course, if you remember the story in Mark 5, when he comes to Jesus, as they're going with Jairus to his house, and there's a crowd, a woman works her way through the crowd and touches the hem of Jesus' garment. Do you remember the story? Jesus stopped, said, who touched me? And, and of course, the disciples said, man, there's a crowd here, Lord. Everybody, everybody's jostling and hitting each other. No, 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 no. Jesus knew virtue had gone out of him. And he knew somebody had touched him in faith. And he stops. Now I'm sure Jairus is thinking, Lord, we don't have time for this. We, we have to be somewhere. Lord, you ever, you, ever, you ever gotten frustrated because God wasn't on your timetable? 
You ever told God how much of a hurry you're in? You ever notice that God's never in a hurry? And God's never in a hurry because you know why? Nothing's impossible for Him. There's no limitations with Him. In Jairus' mind, we have to get there before she dies. And Jesus is thinking, if she's dead, I'll bring her back to life. I'm the resurrection and the life. Resurrection isn't a day. Resurrection is an event. Resurrection's a person. So Jesus has no, no worries at all. And of course, he deals with the woman with the issue of blood, who he heals, and then he goes on to Jairus' house. And when he gets there, they're, they're moaning, they're, they're, they're screaming, they're, they're wailing. Uh, they're mourning for the dead. The girl's dead. Jesus said, she's not dead, she's sleeping. They laughed at him. Said they laughed him to scorn. Made fun of him. So Jesus said, okay, all of you out. He put them all out of the house. And just took in mom and dad with him. Remember what he did? He touched that little girl and had her get up. She got up and was alive. Brought her back from the dead. Why? Is, is, is it... Is it an incredible thing with you that God would raise the dead? Huh? It shouldn't be. He's the mighty God. There's no limitations. You say, well, I might as well, I might as well throw it in and not, nothing can happen now. You, you telling God nothing can happen? Are you telling God He can't do the impossible? Someone said there's three stages any great need goes through. Number one is impossible. Number two is difficult. Number three is God did it. So I'm just in a possible situation. Well, thank God you have a mighty God who can do the impossible. He's not worried about the circumstances. You may be involved with something, say medically, medically speaking, then they say, I can't get any better. Financially speaking, they say, I, I, I don't have any hope. The thing you're thinking about or the trouble you're in, you say, with, with the resources I see them, there's nothing I can do. But wait a minute, you have a mighty God with whom are no limitations. All things are possible with Him. He crosses every barrier. He breaks through the walls. Nothing will hinder Him from accomplishing His goals. He's the mighty God. He transcends time, space, hearts, money, obstacles, the economy, doctors, paychecks, governments, courts, all things. He's the mighty God. He can reverse the irreversible. He can fix the unfixable. He can do the undoable. He can beat the unbeatable. He can save the unsavable. He can change the unchangeable. He's the mighty God. I'm glad He's the mighty God. Nothing could hold Jesus Christ. Not even, not even the grave. Not even death. Not even a stone rolled across the door. That was nothing. He is in control. And as long as I know He's the mighty God, I want Him in control. I don't want to be in control. So I want to reverence Him as deity. I want to rely on Him as my defender. And then number three, receive Him as your deliverer. Receive Him as your deliverer. What's that mean? Trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. Depend on Him to rescue you from sin and from Satan. Back in the book of Zephaniah 3 and verse 17, the prophet said this, The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save he will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in His love. He will joy over thee with singing. He delights in us. He's the mighty one who delivers us from the enemy. I read this story this week, preparing for this message. It was from March 5th, 1994. Deputy Sheriff Floyd Prescott was teaching a class for police officers in the Salt Lake City Library. As he stepped into a hallway, he noticed a gunman was herding 18 hostages into the next room. With a flash of insight, Prescott, who was just dressed in street clothes for the class, joined the group as the 19th hostage. 
He followed them into the room and shut the door. The gunman began to announce the order in which the hostages would be shot. Prescott identified himself as a police officer. The gunman attacked. Prescott shot back in self-defense, killing the gunman and setting all the hostages free. He was a hero. Prescott was a champion that day. And you understand, in the same way, Jesus is our champion. What did Jesus do? He laid aside the heavenly garments and He put on street clothes like us and became flesh and dwelt among us. Entered our world. Joined us here on this earth. All of us who were held hostage to sin and to Satan. And when Satan attacked, Jesus dealt the final blow when He died on the cross as a payment for our sin. And my friend, that sets you free. His death on the cross for you, His substitutionary death for you, means you don't have to pay. it. The price has been paid. You don't have to pay for your sin in hell. Jesus suffered for you. God commended His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And don't just put us there. Put your name in there. I would say God commended His love towards Stan and that while Stan was yet a sinner, Christ died for Stan. I tell people every week in the prison, I said, fellas, believing Jesus died for the sins of the world, you're just believing a fact of history. There's people in hell today that believe Jesus died for the sins of the world. That's not salvation. Salvation is when you say Jesus Christ died for my sin. He took my place. And I trust Him as my Savior. He's my deliverer from sin. Jesus' death on the cross was only temporary. Three days later, He rose again from the dead. The devil's destruction, on the other hand, is going to be quite permanent. He's going to be punished forever in everlasting fire. You read about that in the book of Revelation. But Jesus is the champion. He's our deliverer. Have you trusted Him to deliver you from sin and from Satan? He de- he's the only Savior, listen, from the penalty of sin, which is death and hell. You must receive Christ as your Savior. But listen to me, Christian. He's also the only deliverer from the power of sin. Why don't you trust Him to deliver you from that stubborn habit and addiction that you fight with. If you could have stopped it, you would have stopped it by now. But you can't stop it. You need a deliverer. And Jesus Christ is the mighty one. Just squeal to Him. He'll come. And He'll deliver you. He's the master of the mighty. He's the captain of the conquerors. He's the head of the heroes. He's the leader of the legislatures. He's the governor of the governors. He's the prince of princes. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He is the mighty God. There's nobody before Him and there'll be nobody after Him. He's the mighty God. Do you know Him as your Savior? Do you know Him as your Deliverer? It starts when you reverence Him as Deity. He's the mighty God. Rely on Him as your Defender. Receive Him as your Deliverer. Receive Him as your Savior. The song that we sing at Christmas time says, O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. 
O come to us, abide with us, our Lord, Emmanuel, God with us. His name shall be called the Mighty God. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, take the truth now this morning. Thank you for everyone's attention today. Thank you, Lord, that you're the Mighty God. Lord, I'm asking this morning that each of us would reverence You as God. For You are God. That we would rely upon You as our Deliverer. That Satan has, does not have power. Sin does not have dominion over us any longer. We have a deliverer. And I pray, Lord, that people today would rely upon you as their deliverer. And then I pray, God, if any in this room have never received you as their Savior, that they'd receive you as their Savior today. That you can deliver them from the penalty of sin and from the power of sin. One day, when we get to heaven, we'll be delivered from the presence of sin. But it's all because of the Son that was given, whose name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God.